Hi, I'm Althea Brooks. I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. We're thrilled to welcome you here for the first time or welcome you back to the Spring Symposium 2023. Today's program is part of Lifetime Learning's Building a New Nation, the role of four Virginia presidents. We're fortunate to have John Ragasta from the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello to speak with us on Thomas Jefferson's presidency. He'll be introduced shortly. I hope you enjoyed the, the talk earlier today on George Washington's presidency. You'll also hear from two other uh, knowledge experts giving lectures on April 18 and the esteemed panel of faculty on April 19. Please tune in for each of these informative learning experiences. We look forward to receiving your questions in the Q&A box during this program. Also, closed captioning is available should you need it at the bottom of your screen. Now, please help me welcome our moderator for, this, for these programs, Alan Taylor. Alan Taylor is the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Chair in the UVA's Cochrane Department of History. Alan is the author of 10 books, that's right, 10 books, and the recipient of numerous publishing awards. For 12 years, Alan served as the faculty advisor for the California State uh, Social Science and History Projects, providing curriculum support and professional development for K-12 teachers. In, in 2016, Alan won membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2020 received membership in the American Philosophical Society. Alan, thank you for moderating the Spring Symposium programs. We welcome you and the microphone's all yours. Thanks, Alan, take it away. Thank you, Althea. Uh, it's a great honor to introduce John Ragosta. Uh, John Ragosta is the interim director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. He has taught law and history at the University of Virginia at George Washington University and at Hamilton, Oberlin, and Randolph Colleges. He's the author of Religious Freedom, Jefferson's Legacy, America's Creed, and Wellspring of Liberty, how Virginia's religious dissenters helped win the American Revolution and secured religious liberty. It was published in 2010. He's co-author, excuse me, co-editor of the founding of Thomas Jefferson's University, which published in 2019. And he has a forthcoming book, for the people, for the country, Patrick Henry's final political battle, and this will be released by UVA Press later this year. Now, in introducing John and moderating this program, I'm going to be assisted um, by um, my Thomas Jefferson bobblehead. And uh, John is gonna be speaking about Jefferson, whether it's hypocrisy or moderation. So if, if he comes down on the side of moderation, I'm sure he's, going to be bobbing his head up and down. Uh, now, I've never seen him move his head side to side, but uh, if it's hypocrisy that wins out, there will be a first time. The program is now yours, John. Thank you, Alan. Mr. Jefferson may not be entirely happy with what I have to say, but I think he'll be all right. Um, I was reminded this morning to start out with two, two thoughts. First, uh, tomorrow is Mr. Jefferson's 267th birthday. And I hope those of you in Charlottesville will be joining us at Monticello or at UVA as we celebrate Founders Day. And the second thought to get started is I was very interested in Lindsay's comment this morning that George Washington understood that the nation was on its second chance. I think it's very easy for us to forget how fragile the nation was for the first 20 or 30 years for the period in which these four presidents were acting as president. Um, and, and so I thought that was a useful reminder. But let me go ahead and share my screen and start talking about Mr. Jefferson. So I, I want to talk about Thomas Jefferson. And when I was first thinking about this project, uh, I went back to some of the books on Jefferson's biography. And I immediately went to Dumas Malone's two volume, two very, very thick volume history of just Jefferson's presidency. And it became clear to me very quickly that I couldn't go over Jefferson did this, Jefferson did that. What are the things that Jefferson did in his presidency? We'd be here until May. And so instead, what I wanted to focus on was several 
incidents that people are familiar with, but which I think had broader significance to Jefferson and to the formation of the presidency in our nation. And so I wanna start with the election of 1800. Now we're familiar with the election of 1800. Uh, Thomas Jefferson called it the revolution of 1800 which is actually an interesting term for Jefferson. Uh, if it's a revolution, it was certainly not a blowout. In fact, the election was fairly close. Adams, with a few more electoral votes, could have won that election. And it's significant to note that Jefferson would not have won but for the three-fifths clause, that he got all of those extra electoral votes in the South from the enslaved folks. So when Jefferson talks about the revolution of 1800, he must be talking about something else other than simply the electoral results. Now, the obvious thing that we tend to remember the election of 1800 is as the first peaceful transfer of power. Uh, Lindsay was talking about that this morning as well. And, and certainly that's important. That is a precedent that has been followed in America in very difficult times in 1876 in the Bush-Gore campaign. Until very recently, it was understood that the winner takes office and the loser uh, steps aside. And, and that was important in the election of 1800. But I think there was something more that made this election a revolution for Thomas Jefferson. And I think to understand that, one has to go back and start with 1798. 1798 was a very dark era for Thomas Jefferson and for his political party, the Democratic Republicans. The British and the French were at war almost constantly from the French Revolution beginning in 1789 until Waterloo in 1815. And by 1798, the French believed that the United States was too cozy with Britain. It was being too close to the British. And so we had a quasi war with France. Now this quasi war was a real war. The French had seized over 300 American ships. There was the XYZ affair when uh, Adams sends peace, sends peace commissioners to France and they're refused. The foreign minister won't meet with them unless they offer a bribe. This is a very serious problem. And so as the 1800 election campaign approaches, the issue was the Gallic Jefferson, a traitor to America because we were effectively at war with France versus John Adams. In addition, in preparation for what everyone thought would be a war with France, we had a new standing army. We were increasing our military, we were increasing our Navy. And worse, if you were Thomas Jefferson, the effective leader of the army was Alexander Hamilton. He couldn't think of anyone worse that he would have running a standing army. And then to really bring things to a climax, in 1798, we get the Sedition Act. Now, the Sedition Act, we've heard of it before. We understand it was unconstitutional from our perspective, but at the time, it's a very serious threat. Basically, you can be imprisoned if you criticize the president or the Congress. Now, by the way, you can say whatever you want about the vice president, Thomas Jefferson. You can say whatever you want. But if you criticize the president or the Congress, you can be jailed. Now, for years, for over 100 years, historians have said there were 14 prosecutions under the Sedition Act, and that sounds like a significant but not huge problem. More recent scholarship has shown, th shown there were over 40 indictments. Over 120 people were indicted under the Sedition Act, and it was specifically targeted at Democratic Republican newspaper editors. They were shutting down the opposition press. Now, these Sedition Act prosecutions also were targeting Democratic Republican politicians. This cartoon of Matthew Lyon holding the fire tongs, having a fight on the floor of the House of Representatives. Matthew Lyon, a member of Congress, is convicted of sedition. He wins re-election from a prison cell. This is what Thomas Jefferson refers to as the reign of witches. And he was afraid for the country. He thought the country was at risk. He writes to uh, James Madison that Republicanism will be entirely browbeaten. He writes to another uh, supporter that to preserve the freedom of the human mind and freedom of the press, every spirit should be ready to devote itself to martyrdom. So in this crisis, and it was a very real crisis, what should we do in Virginia? There were reports that Virginia was even arming for a possible conflict with the federal government. Suddenly we were buying arms and ammunition. Several Virginia militia officers were actually quoted in the press as saying, if France invaded America, 
And mind you, it's Napoleonic France. If Napoleon invades America, they were prepared to take their militia units to the French flag rather than the American flag. They're openly talking about treason. In desperation, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison came up with how they could oppose this policy. And they adopted what we know of as the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, attempting to resurrect the idea of the Confederation, the Articles of Confederation, the idea that the states are independent sovereigns in a compact with other states. And therefore, and Jefferson uses this term, the states can nullify federal law. If there's a federal law that the states believe is unconstitutional in their state, the state can make that law a nullity. Now we know that 60 years later, this is going to lead to the civil war. But at the time, this is what Jefferson and his supporters were talking about. One of our questioners earlier had asked about the possibility of succession. Jefferson is talking about succession in 1799. He writes one supporter, determined were we to be disappointed in this, repeal of the Alien and Sedition Acts, to sever ourselves from that union we so much value. This is a crisis of union. The country, less than 10 years old, was at the brink of falling apart. Now, many historians jump from these Kentucky and Virginia resolutions to the election of 1800. And it appears, if you do that, that the revolution of 1800 was all about states' rights and about limiting the power of the federal government. But I think that that completely misunderstands the circumstances. In fact, after Jefferson and Madison had adopted the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, there's an intense counter reaction. George Washington, heard a lot about him this morning. Lindsay was talking a little, about, a little bit about his role in 1798-99. He begs Patrick Henry to come out of retirement. They oppose Jefferson and Madison. They say, you're going to destroy the union with these Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, this radical state's rights. 10 of the 16 other states respond to Kentucky and Virginia and say, you can't do that. That's a violation of the constitution. And maybe most importantly, the Democratic Republicans take a thumping in the congressional, uh, congressional elections of 1799. John Marshall is elected as a Federalist member of the Congress against an entrenched incumbent. Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee Lee is elected to the Congress as a Federalist. These are both deep opponents of Thomas Jefferson. We know John Marshall was going to go on because of that election to become the Chief Justice, be a thorn in Jefferson's side for 30 or 40 years. The election went so badly for the Jeffersonians that in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, which had had three, one, and zero Federalist members of Congress, three, one, and zero. After this election, it was five, five, and two. They went from four Federalists to 12 Federalists in the Deep South. Key point about the revolution of 1800, and I think about Jefferson's presidency. Jefferson and Madison realized their error. This is something we would like politicians to do more often. They realized that the country was on the brink of disaster. The hyper-partisanship was going to destroy the union that they greatly valued, and they pulled back. Within 10 days of the Virginia resolutions that James Madison had drafted, within 10 days of them being adopted, Madison is writing Jefferson saying, you know, maybe we went too far. He writes, it is to be feared their zeal, the Virginia legislatures, may forget some considerations which ought to temper their proceedings. He goes on to say, our actions are subject to the charge of usurpation in the very act of protesting against the usurpation of Congress in the Sedition Act. Madison and Jefferson pull back. They stop talking about nullification. And instead, they start focusing on the violation of the First Amendment, the restrictions on, religion, on uh, press freedom. And Jefferson wins the election of 1800 at the ballot box not by states ignoring federal law, but by the people deciding we want Jefferson rather than Adams. We want someone focused on liberty and freedom in the First Amendment rather than John Adams. So when people skip over these elections of 1799, I think they're missing the point of Jefferson's presidency and they're missing the point of the revolution of 1800. 
Jefferson's presidency, he is accused almost immediately of hypocrisy because he won't do the things that they were talking about in 1798 and 1799. He won't limit the federal government. He won't adopt a radical states' rights agenda. I don't think it's hypocrisy. I think Jefferson is honestly chastened and he moderates his views. Now, let me suggest to you, if you have time, if you think about that, reread Jefferson's first inaugural address. Enormously important address. We quote that address many times. We remember Jefferson's quote, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. I think many historians and many of us American citizens treat that as sort of pablum. It was, he was a winner. It was sort of patting the Federalists on the head. If you reread his first inaugural address, I think Jefferson is saying something much more important. Not only have we had the peaceful transfer of power, we've also had a very clear demonstration of what it means to be a loyal opposition. You can oppose the government without being treasonous. You can oppose the government without suggesting nullification or succession. And Jefferson comes out of that election with a new understanding of the presidency. And he understands that the president speaks for all Americans. He understands the president is the one office in this country elected by the entire country. And so Washington sort of understood that, Adams sort of understood that. Jefferson really embraces the idea that part of my job as president is to be a speaker for the people. Um, and, and I think, by the way, this is so central to American political life. I was on the road the other day and I was listening to NPR and they were interviewing the new mayor of Chicago. You may recall a very difficult Chicago mayoral race, a progressive candidate won, people were quite surprised. He was giving his acceptance speech and he made a very clear point. I am the mayor for all of Chicago. I am the mayor for those who voted for me. I'm the mayor for those who opposed me. I'm the mayor for all of Chicago. And I think that's central to the presidency. And Jefferson was really one of the people to first really understand that because of the danger that had occurred in 1798 and 99. Well, second incident. So I think the first thing Jefferson learns, the president speaks for the entire country. Second incident, the Danbury Baptist letter. Excuse me. Now, again, we're, we're familiar with the Danbury Baptist letter. We've heard of this. This is where Jefferson talks about it. There's a wall of separation between church and state. And we know that Thomas Jefferson is an enormous uh, supporter of religious freedom and separation of church and state. Um, he first meets James Madison in 1776 when they're working together on the Committee of Religion in the Virginia General Assembly. Um, and Virginia adopts Jefferson's statute, the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom in 1786. And after that, every other state is moving in a Jeffersonian direction. They're adopting a more liberal policy. They're moving in the direction of separation of church and state. The holdouts are Connecticut and Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, you still have state taxes supporting religion. In Connecticut, Jefferson writes one supporter that uh, it has a clear subordination of the civil to the ecclesiastic power. And so these Connecticut Baptists write to Jefferson about his views on religious freedom, and he writes back the Danbury Baptist letter saying that the First Amendment includes a wall of separation between church and state. And many people say, well, okay, that's all it was. It was a letter. Justice Rehnquist referred to it as a short note of courtesy. Well, this is his way of saying it wasn't important. It was just Jefferson. Jefferson writes 19,000 letters. So why should we pick this one letter out as particularly significant? But that's really a way of minimizing what Jefferson is saying. And I think it misses what's happening in this incident and what's so important to Jefferson and to the presidency and to the nation. Start with the letter from the Baptists. The Baptists from Danbury write Jefferson, sir, we are sensible that the president of the United States is not the national legislature and also sensible that the national government cannot destroy the laws of each state. But our hopes are strong that the sentiments of our beloved president, which have had such genial effect already, like the radiant beams of the sun, will shine and prevail through all these states and all the world till hierarchy and tyranny be destroyed from the earth. So Jefferson receives this letter and is trying to decide how to respond. And it's not simply a note of courtesy. courtesy. He thinks about it. 
He writes his cabinet members about responding to the Danbury Baptists. He writes his attorney general, Levi, Levi Lincoln, and he tells Lincoln that this is an important letter. It's an occasion by way of answer of sowing useful truths and principles among the people, which might germinate and become rooted among their political tenets. Jefferson understands before the term is used by Teddy Roosevelt, the presidency is a bully pulpit. He understands that he has a unique ability to set the nation's ideals and to talk in, in a way that people will embrace principles that will germinate and become rooted among the political tenets. And he does this on a number of occasions. For example, in June of 1801 in Washington, D.C., the, the, the uh, executive offices of the Congress have moved to the Washington, D.C. It's a growing, basically, village at that point of time. Jefferson makes a point of having his family, having the enslaved people that are there with him in the White House, uh, and having his servants inoculated for smallpox, because smallpox inoculation was still very, you know, highly contested at this point. He wants to say the president of the United States is going to publicly embrace smallpox inoculation. He does this with respect to customs commissioners. He writes a letter to uh, his head of the treasury saying that we've got to be clear to the customs commissioners, which by the way, are the most common office at that time in the federal government, that they are permitted to participate in the political environment, but they must do so as individuals, not as officers. So he does this again and again throughout his, his presidency. He understands the power of the bully pulpit and the power to speak um, as the president in that important way. So third incident I want to talk about. Oops, wrong mouse. I want to talk about the Mary affair. Now, I'm sorry that this is not a great, great picture, but I think it gets across the point. This is a uh, picture from Anthony Mary. Anthony Mary is the new British ambassador to the United States shortly after Jefferson becomes president. And Mary writes about going to meet Jefferson. Now, he's the new British ambassador. Uh, and when you go to present your credentials, this is a very formal event. And he talks about he was in a deep blue coat with black velvet trim and gold braid, white breeches, silk stockings, ornate buckled shoes, a plumed hat he presumably has in his hand, and a large sword. And he goes to the White House to meet Jefferson, and Jefferson comes out to meet him in slippers. This drives Anthony Mary crazy. This is an insult. Then later, Jefferson invites Mary and his wife to a dinner, and he invites the French ambassador and his wife to come to dinner at the same time. France and England were at war. You don't do this. Well, Jefferson, we're a neutral country. We don't operate with those kind of diplomatic monarchical protocols. And then at another dinner, when uh, Mary's wa uh, wife is supposedly the uh, ranking female guest at the event, and they go to be seated for dinner. Now, the normal policy, and again, this was the best picture I could find, the normal policy would be the President of the United States should take the wife of the leading guest on his arm, escort her into dinner. She sits next to him. Ambassador Mary would then take the hostess, whether that was Martha Jefferson or Dolly Madison at the time, take them into dinner. They would sit next to Mary. This was the standard procedure. Jefferson has pell-mell. And the idea is when it's announced it's time for dinner, everybody goes into the dining room and sits wherever they want. This is a painting of Anthony Mary's wife. She's incensed at the idea that Jefferson had insulted her, insulted Britain. Now, there are a lot of people who've commented on the Mary affair. It's a fairly well-known incident in Jefferson's presidency. And it's often looked upon as Jefferson insulting Britain. And that he remembers that when he and Adams were presented to King George, they were insulted and he was insulted. And I think it's that, but I think that it's something more than that. Jefferson in these incidents in the Mary Affair and in many, many other incidents is trying to make it clear the president is a person and he's not a monarch. Now, Lindsay was talking about this morning that George Washington made a great effort to be a man of the people. Uh, he does. But Thomas Jefferson outdoes him by a wide margin in making clear the president is not a monarch. For example, Lindsay was talking about uh, Washington's levies this morning. 
the way those worked, as well as we can understand it, is Washington would come in and he'd be on a raised dies, days, and the people would be brought in in a semicircle around him, and he would speak to them one at a time, and he would address the person on his left, and that person would bow to George Washington. They would exchange a few words with him, and Washington would go around the semicircle one after the other. They would bow to Washington. They would say a few words. When he's done, Washington would leave, and the levy is over. Jefferson comes in and makes it clear that's not the way things are going to run. He shakes hands with people. No more bowing. No more formal levies. We're going to have these informal dinners that are going to be pell-mell. So this is a pattern that, that Washington is aware of, but I think Jefferson really embraces that, no, the president is just a person. He needs to be treated as a person. He can't take on airs of a monarchy. You recall Lindsay explaining John Adams really hurt himself with George Washington when he was talking about using monarchical titles uh, for people. Um, and, and Jefferson is every man uh, in, in a very real sense. Now, by the way, this is very odd. Jefferson's a very wealthy slave owning plantation owner, but he understands he's projecting every man and that that's important to what he understands the presidency to be. So he's going to do that. So the election of 1800, the Danbury Baptist letter, the Mary affair, fourth incident in Jefferson's presidency that I want to address in a broader, broader context, the Louisiana Purchase and the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, again, we know this story well. It's the greatest land purchase in history, perhaps. Um, it, Jefferson really falls into it. Napoleon had hoped to reconquer San Domingue, what we know of as Haiti, uh, which had had a rebellion. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but his army is devastated by smallpox and typhoid and yellow fever. And so he really doesn't have anything to do with Louisiana. He's desperate for money for his wars with Britain. So he offers, Jefferson wants to buy New Orleans so that we could send produce down the Mississippi River. But Napoleon offers him the entire Louisiana Purchase. Even before Jefferson has the Louisiana Purchase, he's planning the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it's curious, he tells Congress, he's trying to get them to fund the Lewis and Clark expedition. And he says, well, this is for commercial purposes. We send them out there, we'll have trade with the natives. It'll be very valuable to the United States. He tells the Spanish and the English and the French that it's all about scientific exploration, but he's desperate to get his hands on this property. And so we have an expansion of territory, uh, largely result of the French. Now, by the way, I put up the cartoon. The view of the Federalist was Thomas Jefferson. He's being stung in this cartoon by Napoleon and is coughing up money for land that they didn't think was important and they didn't think was needed. We already had land up to the Mississippi. It was not well populated. Jefferson said in his first inaugural address before the Louisiana Purchase, that America had land to the thousandth and the thousandth generation. But for Jefferson, this land, the Louisiana Purchase, was critically important for America. Now, we often see this in terms of expansion. Jefferson uses the term an empire of liberty. He's going to strengthen the republic. Some people would point out that Jefferson really begins the United States down the path of manifest destiny. Again, it's a term that's only used later, but that we are going to march to the Pacific, never mind the natives. Jefferson doesn't seem to particularly concerned about the natives. He says as part of the Louisiana Purchase, they need to be moved out of the Eastern United States, east of the Mississippi into the Louisiana Purchase, but he recognizes there will be a time when we cross the Mississippi and we continue to marching west. So, you know, there is that aspect of the Louisiana Purchase that it, it moves the United States towards an empire of liberty built on the backs of dispossession of Native Americans. But what is Jefferson thinking about? Jefferson is very interested and seems to be almost fixated on the difference between American land and European land, the old world and the new world. He understands that our landedness, the fact that we have so much land and that people can buy land and be farmers is unique. He says it's a distinguishing feature of America. They can be independent economically and politically and property holders. I think Jefferson is talking about this man who for him is a quintessential American, the yeoman farmer. 
Jefferson, the Louisiana Purchase was not, and, and Lewis and Clark Expedition, which was opening up this land for not just exploration, but for settlement eventually. Um, it's not just about an empire of liberty. It's very, very much about defining the American spirit. The American yeoman farmer is going to be independent in his pursuit of happiness. Jean Crevecourt writes in his American farmer, an American farmer possessing freedom of action, freedom of thoughts, ruled by a mode of government which requires but little from us, can pursue their own happiness. I think he also, and, and by the way, I should hesitate, that the idea of frontier is part of that, that that's part of the American spirit, that we can pursue ourselves in, in a frontier. The second reason we have to have these yeoman farmers, we need independent voters, independent thinkers. And that wasn't going to happen in the, in the factories or in commerce. He's willing to challenge both the government and the aristocracy because he owns his own land. Jefferson writes in Notes on the State of Virginia, it is the manners and spirits of a people which preserve a republic in vigor. So we want people who are independent in their own spirit and willing to challenge people. Third thing that a yeoman farmer has is attachment to the land. And if you're attached to the land, you're attached to the country. Now, Jefferson famously says when people point out with the movement of people west of the Appalachian Mountains and then later west of the, the Mississippi, that they might form their own country. What happens if they become close to the British or close to the Spanish and they peel off from the United States? Jefferson very bravely says, well, that would be fine if they want to have their own independence. They're going to be brethren of our country uh, and, and we wish them well if they want to have their own republic. Don't believe it. Jefferson very much wants these people to be Americans. He understands that their attachment to the land makes them attached to the government, and, and part of that government is the government of the United States. Um, Peter Onuf, one of our, my advisor and one of our great Jefferson, Jeffersonian scholars, says, Jefferson thus democratized an aristocratic sentiment traditionally associated with the ownership of great estates and dominion over the many dependents attached to them. So Peter's pointing out that in Europe, the duke, the lord of the castle, had people, and the duke was attached to his land and therefore supported the king. And Peter's pointing out that Jefferson's flipping that around. By giving people, the yeoman farmer, the land, they'll be attached to the government. They'll be attached to us. I think a fourth thing about yeoman farmer, it's going to be economically beneficial. They're going to create wealth. This is the area of the era of the physiocrats who believed that the great way to create wealth is from the land, from agriculture. Uh, bankers and commerce are just moving around wealth, but you create wealth by investing in the land and by uh, investing in, in your livestock. And finally, I think the yeoman farmer is critical to Jefferson in terms of wealth distribution. He was very concerned that a huge gap in wealth, and by the way, this is one thing we should be paying attention to today, I suppose, that as a wealth gap grew in America, it could destroy the union because people no longer support the union if they believe the country is only here for the wealthy. Well, one critical way, and Jefferson, by the way, says if that wealth gap gets too large, we should have taxes, the higher proportion of property in geometrical progression, geometrical progression, progressive taxes. But one way to prevent it is by landedness. Everybody is able to have their own farm, or at least most people. This is still true of America today. Approximately two thirds of adult Americans own a home. This is a very, very high percentage around the world. So the Louisiana Purchase, yes, it's about land. It's about this great land deal. It's about an empire of liberty. But I think for Jefferson, it's very much about defining American ideals, defining the American spirit, um, and, and obviously, Washington does this, Madison does this, Adams does this, but I think Jefferson's really focused on this and, and contributes in a very important way to the nation's understanding of itself. I hear people often point out, uh, we haven't talked much about Alexander Hamilton. I don't even know Lindsay didn't talk too much about Alexander Hamilton. Of course, Hamilton and Jefferson at loggerheads over so many issues in the young republic. People point out, we live in a Hamiltonian nation but with a Jeffersonian spirit. We want to think of ourselves in a Jeffersonian context. And these ideas of landedness and the um, Louisiana Purchase, I think, are central to that. 
Now, I hasten to add, um, this is a good point to mention slavery again. Uh, it's a curious problem. Uh, Jefferson says that the farmers are the chosen people of God. The chosen, the people who work the earth are the chosen people of God. As Cinder Stanton points out in her histories of the enslaved people at Monticello, the people working the earth in the South are the enslaved community. Jefferson oftentimes is said to be a great gardener. He's not the one out there with a the shovel. Um, he's very interested in gardening, but there is a problem in this context. It's perhaps the greatest failure, Mark Sturgis points out, the inability to reconcile slavery with the agrarian project. So if you're going to believe that the yeoman farmer is the definition of the American spirit, that's absolutely inconsistent with the idea of slavery. Okay, so fifth, fifth incident, which I think we're familiar with, but has a great deal of importance to Jefferson and to the building of the nation and to what's going to come forward. And I'll be interested to see what, what Tyson Reeder and um, Nick Wood say about this vis-a-vis -vis Madison and, and um, Monroe. And that is the Haitian Revolution, the revolution in Saint-Domingue. Now, the Haitian Revolution uh, starts in 1791. It goes to 1804 when finally they declare independence as the new state of Haiti. It's um, a, a revolution that's almost predictable. In 1791, 90% of the population in Saint-Domingue is enslaved. 90%. Only 6% is white. 4% are free Blacks. The free black population begins the revolt, but then the enslaved community realizes we, we outnumber the whites, you know, 13 to one, um, and we're going to have this revolution. It's a very bloody revolution. Um, there are massacres, um, and these are being advertised, being told about in the newspapers and in the United States, bloody massacres of the French enslavers. France tries to stop the, the Haitian Revolution. Spain tries to stop the revolution. England tries to stop the revolution because they're concerned about spreading revolution among the enslaved communities in the West Indies in the 1790s. In 1804, right before Haiti declares independence, General de Salines from Haiti actively says we need to massacre all of the French that are still in Haiti. So it's this bloody, bloody revolution. Well, the problem for the United States then is what to do about it. Now, John Adams grappled with this kind of this problem, and he its independence. It doesn't declare its independence from France until 1804. But Adams is basically treating them as an independent nation. He sends a charge day affair because of that quasi-war with France. The United States is supplying the food and many of the arms that are being used in the Haitian Revolution. Well, when Thomas Jefferson becomes president, the Haitian Revolution presents an interesting opportunity. Thomas Jefferson, throughout his young life, had said that slavery is wrong, it's unstable, it cannot last. He writes, and this is on the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people are to be free. However, the next sentence is, nor is it less certain than that the two races equally free cannot live in the same government. Nature, habit, opinion has drawn indelible lines of distinction between them. Jefferson understands that these slaves must and will be free, but he also thinks they then must be moved out of the United States, the idea of colonization. Now, you would think that Haiti is an opportunity. And when he's first president, he actually writes James Monroe, who at that point is the governor of Virginia. And he said, suggests that there's an opportunity in Saint-Domingue, that if we free our enslaved people, we could send them to Saint-Domingue. Um, and get them out of our country, insulated there from the rest of the world. He expects the English Navy to keep them from becoming a new Algiers, like the Barbary pirates, and preying on other ships in West Indies. He expects the English and the American Navy to keep them from exporting revolution to the other countries in the West Indies and into the United States. Um, so this is an opportunity that he sees in the Haitian Revolution. 
but then things start happening. These massacres get much worse. As I said, in 1804, uh, the Haitian general, uh, de Salines, formally announces massacring the French, and Southerners in the United States start to pull back even further from the Haitian Revolution. The Virginia General Assembly in January of 1802 says that free Blacks, we have a preference that they be sent to South America or to Africa rather than Haiti. John Taylor of Caroline, who is a great Jeffersonian, he's one of his great political supporters, important politician, he writes a pamphlet in 1803 that says Saint-Domingue, the revolution in Haiti, shows that slavery needs to be a permanent institution in the United States. He writes that the problem in Haiti was not slavery. The problem was this anti-slavery rhetoric that is beginning to appear in the Northern press. And that slavery is really a positive good. And we know this is going to become the Southern story in the United States. Southerners are beginning to see a grave danger from the Haitian Revolution. The idea of a Haitian diplomat in the United States, a States, perhaps moving through the southern United States, offering freedom to any Black who makes it to Haiti. This is an idea which southern politicians, including Jefferson, cannot accept. In 1804, Jefferson approaches the British ambassador, Anthony Mary. We were talking about him a moment ago. And he says, well, can't we somehow contain Haiti? We'll continue to trade with Haiti. We'll send food, not arms. We don't want arm the Black people of Haiti, but we'll send food. But Britain needs to make sure that they're not exporting revolution. Well, Britain at that time in war with France is uninterested. Jefferson instead approaches the French ambassador, Pichon, and he seems to offer Pichon aid that if Napoleon does resubjugate Haiti, we know that doesn't happen. That's what leads to the Louisiana Purchase, but that he, the United States could support. At one point, Pichon reports back to Napoleon that Jefferson had said, nothing would be easier than to furnish your army and fleet, the, Napoleon's army and fleet, with everything and to reduce Toussaint Louverture to starvation, Toussaint Louverture being the leader of the Haitian Revolution. Congress adopts an arms embargo in 1805. In 1806, they adopt a embargo on all commerce. Now there is smuggling that's gonna go on, but we're gonna embargo commerce with an independent Haiti. Jefferson refuses to recognize Haiti. Adams had a charge d'affaire who was in Haiti. Uh, it ends with the Adams administration. There is not going to be another US official in Haiti until 1813, a commercial agent is sent. So what happened? And how does this incident reflect on Jefferson's presidency and on building the new nation? Jefferson's very rightly criticized for his actions in Haiti. But I think there's something fundamental happening to Jefferson and to our ideas about slavery in the Southern United States. Jefferson had consistently advocated emancipation as a young man. He had supported it in the Virginia General Assembly. But by 1805, he's writing to correspondents saying that it's not going to happen early. It's not going to happen now. At the time of the US Constitution, we justified the failure of the act of, of the Constitution to act against slavery as it was preserving the Union. The only way that we could keep the Deep South in the Union, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, was to protect slavery. It was to protect the Union. But now I think it's something else. It's about fear, fear of rebellion. Jefferson seems to abandon his support for emancipation. He's no longer talking about it. When he's asked about it in the 18 teens, he says it's for the next generation. He's no longer seeming to uh, forcefully oppose extension of slavery into the West as he had in the 1780s. He'd oppose extension of slavery not only into the Northwest territories, but in the Southwest territories. That now seems to be gone. And I think this is impacting the presidents, especially Madison, Monroe, Jackson, that the fear now is not fear for union, it's fear for rebellion and fear for our lives. This is the wolf by the ear that Jefferson is talking about in the 18 in 1820. Uh, we are we have the wolf by the ear, it's not safe to hold on, it's not safe to let go. 
And I think this is happening for the nation as a whole. During the American Revolution, at the end of the American Revolution, there was an opportunity on the issue of slavery. There is idea of freedom and that maybe freedom should apply more broadly. We see throughout New England, emancipation laws are adopted or courts declare that people are going to be free. The American South, that was still a possibility at the end of the American Revolution. Virginia adopts a manumission law in 1782 and the number of free blacks in Virginia starts to skyrocket. But it's during Jefferson's presidency, I think, that we start to see a shift and Southern whites, plantation owners become deeply personally fearful. Now, of course, there's other things in the Haitian Revolution. There's Gabriel's Rebellion in 1800. There's the Easter Rebellion in 1802. But I think the Haitian Revolution and Jefferson's change of attitude in the Haitian Revolution is a critical way to understand this because all he had to do was to send an official. All he had to do was send a charge to affairs. He's not emancipating anybody in America. Um, he's avoiding the problem of Georgia and South Carolina threatening to withdraw from the Union. And he's not willing to do it because America's concept about slavery and, and fear of what was going to happen, I think, is skyrocketing uh, in this period of time. Now, um, I've spent a lot of time, I guess I, I, I could go on to a few other incidents, but I think I'm going to wrap up because I'm very interested in your questions. So talking about Jefferson's presidency, as I said at the beginning, I don't want to focus on all of the things he did. We could talk about other things that Jefferson does as president, his acts on the budget, the Embargo Act, the Barbary Wars, but to talk about how some of these specific incidents represent much broader ideas, much broader influence that Jefferson as president, President Jefferson is able to project on the nation, the peaceful transfer of power and a loyal opposition, the bully pulpit of the president, the plebeian approach of the president as a man of the people and just a man, not a monarch, the frontier and the American spirit protecting the Southern slaveocracy out of fear. Now, the presidency is, of course, fascinating as a, a political office. We've, we've talked about that, uh, and that's why we're doing this program. I pulled up last night, I was just curious, these lists that you see all the time on Facebook or Twitter about who are the greatest presidents. Jefferson is consistently listed in one of the top 10 presidents. And I think it's interesting because it's not so much about he did this or he did that, but I think that he defines for us the presidency and the American spirit in ways that are that are really important and lasting today. So with that, Alan, I've said enough. I'd be interested in your thoughts and, and those of uh, those who are listening. Okay, so we have uh, several really good questions here, and uh, which is no surprise uh, given uh, the wonderful range of your presentation, John. Uh, so one question that's come in is, is what influence did Jefferson's ideas on democracy, what sort of influence did those ideas have on countries other than the United States? It's a great question. Um, you know, we talk about Jefferson, and, and by the way, Alan, you may know, I've been trying to figure out who first said Jefferson was the architect of American democracy. Um, I haven't been able to locate it real quickly. But um, it, it would probably be in Andy Burstein's book about uh, Jefferson's legacy. I, right. I'm guessing, you know. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But that's sounds, just like a Roosevelt. sounds like a Roosevelt. Yeah. Um, but it's a very interesting question because Jefferson is very interested in having the ideas that he's propagating, these American ideas spread throughout the world. So when he's in France as ambassador, for example, um, he is spreading around the Declaration of Independence. It's 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 changed it, 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 you know, it's translated into Spanish, it's translated into Latin, it's translated into Italian. Um, I always point out to people, by the way, Jefferson does have a pretty big ego. Um, when he's asked for a copy of the Declaration of Independence, he usually gives people his version rather than the edited version that was actually adopted. Um, but he wants to spread those ideas. He does the same thing with the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom and the idea of separation of church and state. And that continues to have a big impact today. I'm getting a little bit of a reverb. I don't know whether anyone else is. Um, so, you know, we point out at Monticello that Jefferson's words from the Declaration of Independence, over a hundred nations use the language from the Declaration of Independence in their own Declarations of Independence. 
so he's very intentionally trying to spread these ideas uh, around the globe. Okay, that's great. Um, what what precedents did Thomas Jefferson set for um, the exercise of executive power by waging war on the Barbary states? You know, that, that was the other incident that I didn't get to. Um, there's a lot of precedents, it's a good question. Um, he, there is no, in, immediately there's no declaration of war. He sends, um, I mean, keep in mind what's happening is the Barbary states were basically piratical from our perspective that uh, ships that were going through the Mediter Mediterranean would be seized. Britain, Spain, France would simply pay money to the Barbary pirates to leave their ships alone. Um, Adams said that's what we should be doing. We did it for many years under Adams. Jefferson was appalled by this idea. So just send the ships. As they start to get seized and they're seizing American crews and basically enslaving them, Jefferson sends the Navy into the Mediterranean. It's a small Navy at that time, uh, but he sends it into the Mediterranean. Um, and the Navy commanders understand the idea that, okay, we're not officially at war, but if we're attacked or if an American ship is attacked, we can defend ourselves. And so the first attacks on the Barbary pirates are defense uh, without a declaration of war. So that idea is, becomes of course very important. I think you can also argue there's some gunboat diplomacy going on here um, and that becomes very important. Thank you. Um, a question has to do with um, a lot of talk about secession during the early Republic. New Englanders during the War of 1812, potentially Westerners during the, the Burr episode in the early 19th century. Uh, what accounts for this prominence of threats to secede from the Union at that early time? I blame Jefferson. Um, oh. Sorry. He's, he's shaking. Oh, the bobbleheads. He, the bobbleheads. He's not right. happy. Um, and, and that my new book that you had mentioned is going to, this is going to be a central element in that. The Articles of Confederation in the 1780s, the states are paramount. Um, we have a nation, but it's a very loose nation and the states are running it. And everybody understood in the Articles of Confederation that the states are independent. And if a state wanted to pull out, they could pull out. When you get the constitution, that idea disappears. And my understanding of the history is it disappears until 1798, the incidents I was talking about at the beginning, that nobody was talking about succession. Nobody is talking about states are independent sovereigns. Nobody is talking about states have the authority to nullify the government. In the Hamilton Jeffersonian battles in the early 1790s over the bank, over uh, the federal government taking on the state debts, over the carriage tax, over the whiskey rebellion, nobody's talking about that that it's only in 1798 in this desperate moment, and it is desperate. I mean, I'll, I'll grant Jefferson, Jefferson that. Uh, it is a disaster in the Sedition Act. You're throwing people in jail for criticizing the government. Um, Jefferson resurrects the idea of a compact of independent states and uses the term nullify, and he's talking about succession in 1799. His supporters are talking about succession. And then those principles of 1798 that Jefferson has articulated become gospel in the South up through the Civil War. And the idea comes back. Now, important so that Mr. Jefferson will nod his head up and down again. As I said, I believe that Jefferson realizes they had gone too far. Madison perhaps realizes first and realizes the Union is, is at risk. And Jefferson is a great supporter of the Union. Um, Lindsay had mentioned this morning that Jefferson would describe himself as a Virginian rather than an American first. I think there's some truth to that, but he's, he's deeply devoted to the Union. And when he realizes that this talk of states' rights was really threatening the Union, he backs off. He comes back to it, by the way, after the Missouri Compromise in 1820. Um, so the, the issue of succession, back to the question, under the Articles of Confederation, it made sense that any state could do what it wanted. 
Um, but I think that idea is brought back in this crisis of union of the 1790s. And then it's played out. Aaron Burr, Alan mentions Aaron Burr, it comes up again during the embargo and the War of 1812 with the Hartford Convention, and it continues up until the Civil War. Well, the question that, that, that follows on that, John, is, um, as you point out, that before he becomes president, Jefferson's a great champion of states' rights. Then he becomes president and he exercises federal power uh, in a very robust manner. I'm thinking about the embargo as well as the Barbary War or the Louisiana Purchase. So what, what explains this 180 on the part of Thomas Jefferson? Well, there's, there's a cynical, I won't say cynical, one shouldn't be cynical. There's a skeptical response and then there's a different response. I think the skeptical response is it's very easy to be in favor of power when you're the one who has the power. Um, and I think there is some of that going on. He is a politician. He's not a marble statue. He is not perfect. Um, and this comes up in the nullification debates that everybody always wants to nullify the other guy's laws, but they never want their laws to be nullified by the states. So I think some of it is the natural reaction of a politician. Once you're in power, it's safe. I'll give you one example that again, related a little bit to Lindsay's conversation this morning. Um, Washington wants to have a military academy. Nobody's going to give George Washington, the man on the white horse with a sword, a military academy. John Adams wants to have a military academy. Nobody's going to give John Adams. He has monarchical tendencies, military academy. Jefferson says we need a military academy. We give Jefferson a military academy because we're not really worried about Jefferson mounting a horse and strapping on a sword and leading an army against the American people. He gets West Point. So Jefferson believes, and I think others believe, that power is safer in Jefferson's hands. But Edmund Pendleton, one of the great Jeffersonians says, uh, and Virginians, says, yes, but Jefferson's not going to be president forever. We need to embed those states' rights. We need to embed those limitations on federal power. And implicit in your question, Jefferson doesn't do it. Well, I, I think it's partially this recognition that the union is more valuable and more precious than we had thought in the 1790s. And it's only when we were on the verge of losing it that they realized, no, the union, the sheet anchor of our nation, as he says in that inaugural address. Well, let's cut forward then to the Missouri crisis of 1819 to 1820. What, what, what Jefferson do we find there? Uh, Alan, it's a very good question. I think we, we are finding an old and cranky Jefferson uh, by 1820. Um, because that language about radical states' rights basically disappears through the first decade of the 19th century, the second decade. But then when you get the Missouri crisis, he's back to talking about radical states' rights. He says in 1825 about the infrastructure bills, he's very radical about states' rights. And Madison, in both instances, is saying, you know, Mr. Jefferson, you know, down, we can't do that. Madison remembers the crisis of the 1790s better than Jefferson. Madison spends the rest of his long life trying to deny the states that kind of authority to interfere with federal power. Um, I, I do think in Jefferson's defense in the 1820s, it is back a little bit to that distinction I was raising in the Haitian re uh, rebellion, that it's a fear for the union. Uh, he recognizes that this is going to destroy the nation. Uh, and he's right. It's going to be 40 years later. This is going to tear the nation apart. Um, my criticism of his failure to recognize in the Haitian Revolution is that wasn't about tearing the nation apart. Uh, Georgia and South Carolina wouldn't have said anything if we'd recognized Haiti. That was about fear um, of, of the enslavers. Um, but you're absolutely right. Jefferson gets back to a much more radical state's rights agenda, starting with the Missouri Compromise. But Madison does not. And I'll be interested to see what Tyson has to say about that next week. Well, I wonder if you could say a bit about what does union mean to Jefferson, particularly when we get up into the 1820s. It's pretty evident that he and Madison see the union as having somewhat different structure and function. I wonder if you could say something about that. That's absolutely right. And early on uh, in the 1790s, keep in mind, Jefferson's not here for the Constitutional Convention. We constantly have to correct people about this at Monticello. They talk about Jefferson helping to draft the Constitution. He's in Paris. He's enjoying fine wine and good food. He's very skeptical of the Constitution because he's afraid it's creating a government that's too powerful. And so from the 1790s on and into his presidency, he wants to define the union 
as outward looking. It's focused on foreign affairs. It's focused on things like the Barbie pirates. Anything domestic is inward looking at states' rights. But as your earlier question points out, he's not really living by that advice by the time he's president. He sort of understands that, no, the country really does have important functions state to state, interstate commerce. Jefferson, after all, signs the bill for the Cumberland Road, the first great national infrastructure project. Um, but you are correct that, that Jefferson always has, at least intellectually, a narrower view of that union than I think even, uh, now Madison backs off infrastructure at the very end of his presidency. Um, but Jefferson does come back to this idea that the critical element of the nation is outward looking. But as I said, as president, he doesn't really abide by that consistently. So, so is his presidency then kind of an anomalous interlude in his life and his political views? I, I think arguably, yes. As I said, I, I do think it's moderation. I think it's honest moderation. Uh, as I said earlier, I think he's doing what we want a politician to do. He realizes right. how dangerous the 1790s were. And, and um, there's other examples. For example, in the 1798, Kentucky is basically threatening that if you prosecute somebody in the Deep South for the Sedition Act, we will free them. We will not allow them to be jailed. Virginia has a bill and it's not passed, but they introduce a bill that says a Virginia state court can issue habeas corpus against a federal judge. So that if a federal judge imprisons somebody under the Sedition Act in Virginia, the state courts will get them out. Well, you know, this would have been direct confrontation with the federal government. When Jefferson and Madison rethink and a calendar, James Calendar is thrown in jail in Virginia under the Sedition Act. Monroe writes them a letter and basically says, don't do anything stupid. Let Calendar rot in jail because it becomes a great political issue. We can say that, look, they're in interfering with the First Amendment. They're interfering with freedom of the press. But if you continue to push the state's rights, it sounds disunionist. It sounds secessionist. And so Calendar's left in jail. Nobody tries to get Calendar out of jail. Um, so I do think Jefferson goes through a significant change. I, I've not used your term of interlude, but I do think that his presidency and, and then into the 18 teens, he has a very moderated view of the federal government and of federal power. Um, as you might expect, there are several questions about Jefferson's attitudes toward race and slavery. Uh, and one of the questions is, would you describe him as a moderate on those sorts of issues? Oh, no. Um, it's an interesting way to phrase the question. N no, I, I, Jefferson, um, Jefferson, in fact, especially as an early man, is very consistent about how wrong slavery is, how it's evil. Um, how it has to stop, it must end. He supports emancipation as an early man, although oftentimes he supports it not simply because of what's being done to the enslaved people, but because of the damage it does to the whites, uh, that it destroys their notions of, of working and, and uh, they become tyrants in their own homes. Um, and Jefferson never abandons his the idea that slavery will and must end. Uh, and so I don't think he's an moderate, but he's also not a moderate on racism. He says terribly racist things. Um, he says racist things that he must know better. He talks about black blood is different from white blood. He's seen black and white blood. Um, so, you know, the problem with Jefferson on slavery, I don't think is, I don't think moderation is a term that I would use. I think it is very consistent. We, we focus on Jefferson because he's the one who wrote all men are created equal. He enslaves over 600 people, including some of his own children. But I think that conflict in Jefferson is not unlike the inherent conflict in slavery. It's a system that is brutal, vicious, dehumanizing. And yet at the same time, equally, these people are fully human. They live, they laugh, they love, they have birthdays. The institution just creates that kind of conflict, and Jefferson is perhaps the leading example of the 
terrible nature of that conflict. Thank you. What role did Jefferson play in ending the import slave trade into the United um, States? That's a good example. I mean, he, he very much supports ending that slave trade. He introduces the bill to end the slave trade in 1806. It doesn't end till 1808 because the Constitution said it couldn't end until 1808. But you know, a year and a half before then, he's telling Congress, you need to end the slave trade. Now, people point out, let's go back to the moderation issue, that if you're in Virginia, it's very convenient to end the slave trade because that means the new cotton South in South Carolina and Mississippi and Alabama are gonna to have to buy your enslaved people and the value of slaves go up. Um, but Jefferson also understood the slave trade was a um, terribly vicious, horrific institution. And he is arguing to end the slave trade back from the 1770s when he's first in the General Assembly saying this needs to end. He, of course, writes that into the Declaration of Independence um, that we tried to end the slave trade and the King George won't let us. Of course, that's taken out by the Deep South. Um, so he's, he's quite consistent on the slave trade must end. Mm -hmm. And I had several questions which are about the, the transition power in 1801. Uh, and one of those questions is, what is, what is Jefferson doing or thinking during the crisis in February, March of 1801, when there is this prolonged deadlock? Yeah, I hadn't uh, talked about the, the deadlock, for those uh, listening, is the Aaron Burr tie. Uh, we don't have the 12th Amendment yet. Aaron Burr was supposed to be Jefferson's vice president, but they tied in the Electoral College. And a tie in the Electoral College goes to the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is the lame duck Federalist House of Representatives. Many of them were trying to prevent Jefferson from becoming president. Um, he later writes that, oh, it was just the Constitution operating. It was all fine. There was never any talk about violence. No. Um, he receives a letter from the governor of Pennsylvania, Governor McKean, saying, I've got 30,000 men under arms ready to march on Washington, DC, if the Federalists steal the election from you. He tells John Adams, he meets John Adams on the streets in Washington, DC, and he tells Adams that you need to stop this or there's going to be blood in the streets. And Adams says, this is not my problem. I'm a lame duck here. This is up to you to solve. Um, so he's very much engaged. Now, Jefferson always says that he refused to cut a deal, that um, the, the deadlock in Congress, he, he, he says his official position is, it was not my job to cut a deal. Congress needs to resolve this job. Everybody knew in the nation I was supposed to be president, which was true. There was no question Aaron Burr was not supposed to be president. It was Thomas Jefferson. Um, my own view, and, and Lindsay will undoubtedly have interesting views on this, is that, that Jefferson did have um, some conversations. Uh, and, and people, I, I worked in Washington as a lobbyist for 20 years. These are easy conversations. You never commit to anything. But you say, well, of course, as president, I would never fire everyone. That would be terrible to try to hire all these new positions. It would be impractical to fire all the Federalists. So I've not committed not to firing the Federalists, but whoever I'm talking to goes back and reports, Jefferson's not gonna fire all the Federalists. So I, I think he was actually um, much more than he will admit involved in those negotiations. Mm -hmm. um was Jefferson offended that John Adams did not stick around to attend his inauguration? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm sure he noticed. He's a very observant, very smart guy. Um, Adams, of course, says, well, it was just convenient. I had to get out of town. Um, Jefferson and Adams, of course, are estranged at that point in time. Um, the politics of the 1790s, that Hyper partisanship that I was talking about had forced them apart, even though they were close friends. Um, in the 1796 election, Jefferson, uh, after the 1796 election, uh, Lindsay had mentioned this morning that Jefferson's glad that Adams had won. Um, she didn't mention, Jefferson actually writes a letter to Adams after that election and says, Look, it's better that you win than I win. You're the older, you're the senior, you led us in the revolution. Let me help you and whatever I can do to help your administration. Imagine Joe Biden wins the presidency, but Donald Trump is going to be vice president. Donald Trump writes Joe Biden a letter saying, I will help you in any way I can for the good of the country. Madison advises Jefferson not to send that letter. 
And I think that's when you really start seeing Matt Adams and Jefferson pulling apart. So I think he probably just thought it was more of the same. He later writes to Abigail Adams that what he really held against John Adams was the midnight appointments. In that period of time between mm -hmm. the electoral victory and Jefferson taking office on March 4th, Adams is quickly signing commissions for new federal judges, for new justices of the peace. And, and Jefferson was outraged by that. He said, look, you knew I was president. I should have had the right to fill these offices. Um, so I, I think it just adds to the estrangement, but I don't think he ever comments on it. Okay. Um, to what degree did Jefferson adhere to George Washington's precedence in conducting the presidency? That's a very good question. He, um, in some ways, I mean, he is having cabinet meetings like Washington did, uh, Lindsay was talking about. His cabinet is, um, he often would claim, and I think one could argue it's true, was the most congenial cabinet maybe in American history. Uh, and it's also brilliant. He's got James Madison, Albert Gallatin, you know, these great thinkers. Um, he also had Henry Dearborn. He, okay, well, there are exceptions to the rule. Um, but he's running the cabinet in much the way uh, Washington did. He certainly, um, you know, he's he's taking Washington's every man and, and as I said, projecting that even further. Um, he certainly understands the separation of the civil versus military authority that Washington was trying to express. Um, the foreign affairs power. I mean, I'm sort of going through a list in my own head. Uh, Washington's assertion of the foreign affairs power and the Jay Treaty and on uh, neutrality proclamation. Jefferson certainly carries that on. So yeah, we're seeing some continuity there. Okay. Uh, and, and then why does Jefferson want to have a military academy? It doesn't sound like something Jefferson would want. So how do we explain that? Yes, yeah, it's very un-Jeffersonian. And by the way, if you go to uh, West Point, the, the library is called the Jefferson Library. There's a full-length portrait, a full-size portrait of Jefferson outside the library. Uh, they honor Jefferson because of his support. Um, I think it's related to the um, idea of the Louisiana Purchase and the expansion of the country, because keep in mind, the military academy at that time was engineers. And they were needed for military defense, because if you're going to attack a fort or have a siege of somebody's, uh, you know, trench works, you needed those engineers. But it was also about having a military that could help out west, help move the frontier forward, help with the settlement. And he also was critically interested in expanding the military. The military was heavily federalist at that time. Washington and Adams had appointed all the officers, basically. Uh, it was a bastion of federalist. He would view it as arguably monarchist, great power to the president thinking. And he wanted a West Point that would help democratize the military because it's going to be a meritocracy. We're going to send these smart young men, of course, at that point in time. That's uh, great, John. I see I've got a message from Althea that we're at time. Huh? Uh, so, so we have to stop right there and, and turn it back over to Althea. But thank you very much, John. This has been great. Thank that, you. that was really, really good and didn't mean to cut you off, John. You'll have more time at the panel discussion <laughs> on the 19th. Uh, but thank you so much. John and Alan, you guys did a fantastic job. And, and the questions that came in from our audience were right on point and, and fantastic. We learned some really little known facts about Jefferson today. So thank you, John. Thank you, Alan, so much. Today's lecture was recorded and will be available in the Lifetime Learning's podcast library in about a week after the conclusion of the spring symposium. We look forward to hearing from Nicholas Wood and James Mon on James Monroe and Tyson Reeder on James Madison presidency on April 18th. Please join us. Visit Lifetime Learning's website for future programs, engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday on April 18th.